Hey, this is Avia Ray, or however you want to pronounce it, your choice, and I'll be doing a quick lesson on the basics of shading. There are plenty of materials you could use to shade, such as pens, markers, colored pencils, but for the purpose of this video I'll be using sketching pencils. On the subject of sketching pencils, sometimes they come in packs like this, and sometimes they're sold alone. But I would recommend getting more than one grade of pencil, which allows shading for different values and is helpful for different uh, methods of shading. Have you ever taken a closer look at your pencils and noticed that they have a bunch of numbers and letters on them? Those numbers and letters refer to the pencil's grade. The grade of a pencil refers to the softness or hardness of the graphite of the pencil. Softer graphite pencils, such as those in the B range, are great for sketching and shading even though they leave darker marks, because the softer the grade, the easier it is to make marks on the paper. On the other hand, some people prefer the H grade because the marks it makes are lighter and that makes it easier to erase the pencil marks. Another thing I should mention before we start getting into things is that there's one word I use pretty consistently throughout the video, and that word is value. For those of you who don't know what that means, value refers to the lightness or darkness of a color, object, or idea. One of the most important aspects of shading is how light affects an object. Shading can't really exist without a light source that casts a shadow. Some people struggle with getting shading correct when they do it from memory or their imagination. So one of the best places to start when it comes to light sources and shading is to pick an object with a simple shape, such as a spherical object, and draw from observation. I know a lot of people aren't fond of drawing from observation, but what you learn from observing an object in real life can translate to the knowledge you have of an object or objects in the realm of whatever you create from an idea or your imagination. There are two important things to consider when looking at how light affects an object. The first is the direction the light is coming from when it hits the object. If the light is to the left of an object, the shade will be on the right. If it's behind the object, it will be at the front. Basically, anywhere the light is, the shadows aren't. The second thing to consider is how far or close the light source is to an object. The closer a light source is to an object, the sharper and smaller the shadow will be. The further a light source is to an object, the blurrier and larger the shadow will be. Personally, when I draw, I like to use cell shading, which is very simple to use. It's basically composed of a flat valued layer based shading and is a great shading method for beginners. Cell shading can be described as blocking out shading in easily recognizable forms and shapes. You can generally have as many layers or complexities as you want. Sometimes my drawings have two layers of cell shading, sometimes it has more than ten. So don't let whatever number of layers I use as examples in this video keep you from experimenting with different numbers of layers yourself. As you know, the further you get from the light source, the darker it gets. So let's try to apply that to the layers and cell shading. Let's try it with three layers. The brightest value will go closest to the light source. For drawing on a white piece of paper, we'll pretend this object has no reflective properties and leave this area white. For the second layer, as a part of the object that is neither close to the light source or far from it, the value will be slightly darker than the first layer, but not too dark. When an object is under harsh light, sometimes this layer doesn't exist, and an object will only have the lightest and darkest layers, without any values in between. In soft light, the shadows are more blended, and there's more potential for more layers as there are more values in the shadow when this happens. As for layer 3, this point of the object is the furthest from the light source and will be the darkest. Sometimes, depending on the shape of the object, there will be a layer 4, which I like to call backlighting. Backlighting happens more often on rounder objects and is what appears to be a sliver of light behind the darkest part of an object. Backlighting can be caused by a number of things, such as a second light source on the opposite side of an object from the primary light source or the result of a reflection off of another surface the primary light source is hitting. 
which bounces back up and lights up the backside of an object. Backlighting can also be the result of light wrapping around an object, which is why it's more common with rounder objects. Another part of shading that's important to consider is the drop shadow. A drop shadow is the result of an object casting its shape onto another surface in the form of a shadow. Drop shadows are longer when the light source is more on the opposite side of an object, and shorter when the light source is more above an object. Generally, there is no drop shadow when the light source is directly above an object, unless the object is floating above the surface the shadow is being cast onto. Naturally, the world doesn't just consist of round objects. Generally, we need to think about other shapes as well. I try to split shapes into three different groups. There are shapes with just rounded surfaces only, like spheres, shapes with a combination of flat and rounded surfaces like cylinders or cones, and shapes with just flat surfaces like prisms and cubes. Oftentimes, shapes from those groups can combine to create more complex shapes. When shapes are combined like that, the shading outcome can be quite different than if the shapes were by themselves, but we'll talk more about that later. Since we've already covered the basics of shading on rounder objects, let's see how it works on objects with flat surfaces. Looking at these walls, we can see that the shading is more split off based on how much light is hitting each surface instead of gradually falling off like it would on a rounder surface. To some degree, light can still fall off on each individual surface, but each surface still generally tends to have different overall values from one another, depending on how the light is hitting the shape. Let's try and translate these facts into the layers of cell shading. As we've already discussed, each layer of cell shading gets darker the further it gets from the light source. For a shape that only has flat surfaces, we can translate each layer's value to each surface of this cube instead of drawing out where each layer goes like we would for a rounder object. Again, drawing from observation even for objects with flat surfaces like this cable box can help give you an idea of how light would affect this shape in real life. It won't always be the case that each surface of a shape like this will have different values. Depending on where the light source is and how strong it is, some surfaces may have the same values as one another. For cylinders and cones, all we have to do is combine the knowledge of shading we learned from round objects and objects with flat surfaces. If we look closer at the rounded part of the cylinder, we can see that light and shadow wraps around the base, with the light source defining a point that shadows will start from on either side of said point. The easiest way to define this light point is by imagining a strip of light, which generally runs the entire length from one end to the other. Cylinders are also capable of having backlighting as well, due to the fact that it has a round part for light to wrap around. Concerning the flat surface of a cylinder, you would treat it as you would a flat surface on a cube or prism. Depending on how close the surface is to a light source, you could have a similar value to one that can be found on the rounded part of the cylinder. It isn't always the case that the shadows on both sides of where the light is hitting can be seen. This mostly depends on both where the light source is and where your current perspective on the object is. This is a concept that can also be applied to other shapes and objects as well, such as spheres or cubes. Where you are in relation to the object and light source affects what the shading will look like on a first-person basis for observational drawing. This concept can also be translated to original works, because the field of vision present in a picture you are creating is largely based off of a single first-person point of observation. Now that we've covered shading on a variety of objects, you may be thinking, great, so I can shade cubes and spheres, so what? Well, earlier I mentioned that combining objects can affect how the shading looks on both objects. Understanding how objects interact, and the shadows that happen because of this interaction will ultimately bring you closer to being able to shade on more complex objects, environments, and characters. One of the best ways to understand how shapes are capable of being components of more complex shapes is to deconstruct a more complex object into different pieces. Take a look at this shell, for instance. While it is covered with grooves and a number of uneven surfaces, you can see that it can easily be divided into a number of cones and rings. Taking a closer look at all the cone-like structures, even though there's a texture on the surface that catches the shadows, we can still see that the shading we learned for cones still applies, 
you can see that generally, shadows and light wraps around the surface of the cone shapes converging near the point. Cones aside, we can see that this entire conch is composed of rounded surfaces, so in addition to what we know about shading cones, we can also apply what we know about shading rounded surfaces. On complex rounded surfaces like this one, the shadow still wraps around the object, but it does so following the shape of the object. For an observational drawing like this, you can see for yourself how the shading looks like on more complex objects. However, when you have to create objects for your own works, while it is good to use references, you can still call upon the basic shading you know to make decisions on how to approach shading in your own art.